Under the positive and proactive care update, you'll see a very brief update on prone restraints. Just to let the board know that we've tasked the positive and proactive care group to have a complete refresh. So looking at its membership, its terms of reference, um, and starting with the next quality um, and safety meeting, we're going to start to hopefully see a broader report from the positive and proactive care group, looking at much more uh, a much larger range of restrictive practices. Um, so we'll get a better different quality feel from that. Um, the final thing to mention in that section of the report is there was a never event that was reported to the committee. That was the insertion of a midline inserted into the wrong patient. Um, it was within the acute hospital, but it was our staff who were working, reaching into the hospital. So we held a joint um, meeting, really proactive learning session, um, full duty of CANDA utilised and some really good learning that was identified and has already been implemented around its basic checking procedures of patient identity um, that have been updated and no harm was caused, it's important to note. Mortality, again, um, rates continue to be with expect within the expected variance. The group was tasked to look at benchmarking and whether we could feasibly benchmark against other community hospitals. Acute hospitals have a national benchmarking tool which is really useful. Um, working through it, the, the very quick answer is no. There isn't a, a benchmarking available for community hospitals but we'll carry on working through some community hospital indicators. We found we have found a national benchmarking tool for other indicators so we'll look to input into that next year, um, which should give us a different range of benchmarking indicators we can use to support that. Um, research and development, just a, a quick highlight, there's a, a looking at a feasibility of a research bus. That isn't a new invention, other areas do it, particularly with rural areas. Um, so hopefully with, when the feasibility studies completed, that will have the feedback here, but that looks like a really positive option to increase engagement in research. The care notes outage, um, as you've heard earlier, we now have permission to reconnect and that reconnection package is beginning. We continue to monitor the quality and safety impact on that and report through QNS. There are multiple quality and safety impacts, but they are being really well managed by teams. Teams have, have really worked incredibly hard and credit to them for managing these risks so robustly. Um, and there's an impact again on things like um, our ability to do SIs and complaints. But again, that's been managed incredibly effectively with teams and complainants and other individuals. Uh, the final impact is around our sequins, which were paused due to our inability to report against them without care notes. We are due to report in quarter four, but again, I've raised the issue that how accurate that quality and safety data will be. So we'll will liaise with the ICB as to how effective that will be if we should continue. And finally, we have the CQC in Hillcrest. And as noted earlier, we have the exceptional um, Q&S meeting this afternoon. The risk summit process continues. Actions can continue to be embedded. It's a difficult and challenging environment that's really driven by the staffing resource we have there. So our ability to change and transform at pace is being challenged. And as Sarah outlined earlier, we've still awaiting any feedback from the CQC. We still understand that the submissions we made are being scrutinised by a member of the inspection team and an independent inspector. And then we'll hear back. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, I've got nobody showing, so I assume you've got away with that. No questions. Uh, I would uh, thank you for the work that's been ongoing in these difficult times around community hospital mortality rates. I know that I had an input some while ago. Um, so thank you to you and the team for those those wider investigations across the nation to see if anything can be done. And I'm very much assured that we're, we're doing all that we can within the environment that, that prevails across the nation. So, so thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, Elaine, workforce. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, I'll uh, uh, again just to remind uh, colleagues in the the public arena. This is in response to our trust strategy and specifically around our, our workforce needs. Um, uh, I'll, I'll reference um, sickness. Uh, we've we've seen a steady increase in that, and I think what we're trying to do is. Uh, 
make some more proactive interventions about how we manage that. Um, I think the, the current challenges being experienced by staff is also being impacted on by uh, appraisals, but we're working with managers to ensure that that does happen in a timely fashion. And through that, we've rolled out the My One to Ones, uh, which has captured uh, 90 of our 120 managers specifically. In terms of particular interventions working with our staff, uh, Tessa mentioned the People Experience Dashboard, which is a, a, a triangulation of what the staff experience um, data is telling us from a drawn from a number of places, uh, Freedom to Speak Up, EDI initiatives, HR, um, employee relations, uh, capture, and then monitoring that over a regular basis. This will be reported into Workforce Committee going forward. It also picks up our res and DES data. Um, also worth saying that in terms of health and well-being, we continue to see a steady uptake of that from staff. Um, but we, uh, it's also worth committee noting that we are coming to a period of uh, ending of funding for that in the next few months. And uh, of course, uh, a real concern for us, we're, we're currently looking at a number of options with regard to how we continue to offer what is an important part of the uh, service to support staff in uh, in a place where the challenges aren't going to, to go away. We're continuing with on-the-spot recruitment events with uh, some success specific in specific areas, uh, uh, health visitors. Uh, we're working with them more on a more bespoke basis now to look at what those specific concerns are and tailoring our response to, to meet that. Uh, supporting staff to work more flexibly has also been a priority and, and we're doing that as now a day one offer. We continue to be challenged on the front of reducing the time to hire, uh, but we're, we're now beginning to explore as we get care, no care notes back in train uh, to work with David, David's team about how we can digitalise this um, and use that to reduce the time even further. So that will be one of, uh, one of our priorities. In supporting and hearing from staff in a more meaningful way, we finally managed to launch our Staff Voice Forum, uh, very well attended, positively received. We have our first formal meeting in February next month where we'll be taking data from uh, the Pulse survey and responding to real time, real issues and ensuring that that 360 loop comes back to us as execs and looking at opportunities to learn, adjust and amend. Uh, reference to, again, Tessa mentioned that the Freedom to Speak Up report, I think we've managed to progress some of that uh, more quickly. We've made some decisions informally, as Tessa mentioned in the background, and we're looking at A, that we progress the gap analysis, but then more speedily address the issue of um, resourcing and capacity. So that will also be happening as well. Supporting our staff to be more effective and working with each other. We've, we've rolled out the uh, team engagement tool and we're working with staff around that. On the matter of EDNI, our res and our des, uh, we've got a very clear action plan that we're going to be implementing as well. And on the long term, medium long term workforce piece, uh, increasing our footprint in the area of apprenticeships. And we're about to roll out uh, a program which is specifically aimed at staff who are going to be new to care. So that's a quick canter through, but I'm happy to take any questions, specific questions on the uh, workforce report. Any questions from anybody? Sarah. I was just interested in the apprenticeship element that I think is mm -hmm. right at the end. Yes. Um, I, I think we're doing fantastically well in terms of, you know, 178 apprenticeships on four, 17 programmes is amazing, isn't it? So that's really positive. But I was just interested, Elaine, because historically we've always done a lot of business apprenticeships and less in care. Do you think mm -hmm. that balance is now really shifting? Because obviously what we yes, really want yeah. is people coming through all of our pathways, isn't it? So. Yeah, no, um, Ali's doing a piece of work with um, managers out in the clinical space about what that might look like. I've got to say we've had a bit of, I wouldn't say resistance, but apprehension, because the, the, the focus tends to be on 
they want staff who are not new to care they would just go through the diploma program and we're saying actually we're going to have to take a bit of a punt here and and be more proactive this is about having staff in our workforce who are going to stay with us at the end of it so much more um focus on the, the clinical aspect of it is is where we're going with that thank you and natalie are you going to add to that yeah, so I think one of the challenges we have about particularly healthcare support worker apprenticeships is we already have the really successful healthcare support mm. worker development program That's that we right, run yeah. with at NHSP um, that staff like familiar with. We get really positive feedback. So staff are naturally challenging. Well, why do we want to do something different when we've already got a really successful internal program running? Um, so it's a, it's a natural, understandable challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Elaine, if I could just ask, could you yeah. could you unpack the sickness a little bit more, please? And what I mean by that is, is how much are we? I wouldn't expect you to have the exact figures, obviously, mm -hmm. but there's obviously COVID, there's flu, and then there's the pressures that go along with work, whether that's anxiety, depression. I, and looking at our stats, the charts only go up to the end of October, which seems quite a bit of a lag, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But the worrying thing is obviously the last bit of the chart, it's steeply upwards. So yeah. wh where are we where are we now intuitively or your latest figures you'd yeah. have in your department? So, and how does um, the yep. sickness stack up? Yeah. So what we're doing is more of a deep dive within the SDUs through the integrated governance meetings with and the HR managers attend those as a matter of course. So I've specifically asked for probably more pokey questions around long term sickness and what's attributing what the attributing factors are to that. Some of it is, um, I have to say, Mark, people are taking sickness because they're tired. They are relating it to, to work, the pressures of work, um, linked to some of the conversations we've already had around staffing um, and the worries that uh, colleagues have around that. Working with the SDUs, obviously, we're having conversations about how can we manage it. Um, and some of that, although it feels like it's a bit of a, a backward step, is exploring with staff whether or not they want to work more flexibly. We don't have, um, because we've only started doing this very recently in light of the uptick, uh, we don't have exact de detail, but I'm happy to bring some back about the various interventions we're making with with different areas about how we address long-term sick or regular spells of short-term sickness, because there is also that pattern that we're also working with. I'm sure Tessa will pick this up through yeah. through her, her committee, but obviously there's, there's two things that I, I would say is that every member of staff that's available slash unavailable makes a difference, and we know that wherever yeah. they work. And the second one, my, a, a little concern that we're starting to normalise because of pandemic, et cetera, the, this higher level of sickness where our target's 4% and because of a variety of um, things over the last two or three years, we're sort of running around that sort of five and a half, six percent 6%. That's a lot of staff. So I'm just seeking assurance that we're, that we're on top of the reasons and the actions and mitigations. But I, I don't need to comment on that now because yeah. I know Tessa will pick that up. But it's, I think every little bit helps, doesn't it, in terms of getting our staff um at the front line through, through whatever means mm -hmm. yeah if there's nothing else through workforce thank you very much elaine uh, and we now move to robert and the performance report robert thank you chair um yeah a few a few items to draw out so just in terms of um the first part uh always feels a little bit late doesn't it but the the formal notification of the trust segmentation from from back in the august september period um that is all likely to be changing come the new year, but I think at the moment we're expecting to have a, a kind of a, a formal Q4 process as well. A little bit unclear exactly how that's fitting with the NHSE regional team and the ICB, but um, we, are, we are working and evolving as we go through on that. But um, as you see for the record, we've got um, retained segment one and uh, the system remains um, at three with with a number of the known challenges we've put a little bit more in the exec summary this time just to pick up on the system metrics that we've included in the report which were there um and in terms of the narrative there that's just drawing out things that we've been discussing at quite some length but um obviously very much a focus on urgent uh, and emergency care elective recovery uh, and cancer weights feature very highly 
um, all areas where as a system where we are um, you know struggling um, then we get into the detail of the domains that we that we brought a um, couple of uh, meetings ago and just draw out the key elements um, most of the underlying information and performance is remaining similar so whilst we are making progress on things like IAPT and so forth clearly we, we remain behind where the uh, the national target is around the access although we're, we're doing well on the uh, recovery of the waiting times and the likes um, I'll just reference you back to the never event which would normally feature in here which Natalie talked about uh, timing element there and, and sort of the negotiation around exactly where the never event was going to be attributed so that will feature in future um, uh, reports again uh, it's it's you know that is quite a big issue from a um, from an oversight framework perspective um, and then I just wanted to draw out that um, through the committees um, and through Finance Performance Committee, we've agreed a new format of the summary of the um, recovery plans that we'll be then using through the various committees. And that will just hopefully help to reinforce the point that different committees are picking up different items that we have. So, for example, there's a number going through workforce that Tess is aware of, uh, quality and safety and uh, F&P itself, and, and that will be drawn together. And we're going to use a, a common document to uh, to help uh, drive those discussions. So um, that's my summary, uh, Chair. I'm happy to uh, take questions. Thank you, Robert. Any questions? Only one thing I picked up, Robert, and, and it's probably a, a lag thing, is, is the dashboard doesn't mention the one never event yet. We've obviously reporting it in the narrative, but it's not hit the dashboard. Is that a timings thing, is it? Technically, it hadn't hit because we were still going through the process of attribution and the, the lag bit, but it will. Yes, but that's exactly the reason. Thank you very much indeed. OK, which takes us on then, if there's no questions, I don't think there are, to finances. Yeah, thank you. Again, Mark, um, there's um, quite a good summary in terms of the exec summary and probably three three key things I just want, want to draw out really. Um, first one is uh, this year remains very difficult as we're all aware, but we are still on, on track to deliver the planned, um, the planned spend and um, position for this year. Also the system, although uh, experiencing all sorts of pressures is on track at the moment to deliver the the overall net 14.8 million deficit, which um, is is seen as quite a, an important marker around systems being able to set out where they expect to be able to deliver that. So a lot of pressure at the moment, clearly all the issues around additional capacity being um, required and so forth is stretching things, but we, we remain on track with that. Um, Agency spend continues to be probably our um, most significant areas of focus and will remain so as we go into the into the new year. I'll, I'll pick up a little bit just about that, if I may, in a moment. Uh, and then the final one was um, a little bit of good news. Um, we managed to we, we've have confirmation from the regional team that um, the the cash flow issue that I alerted board to around um, the dormitories um, schemes. We, we have managed to broker that into next year. So we've got I'm waiting for the formal formal approval, but we've managed to get that. So that that is a bit of bit of good news. So clearly we still need to maintain close working relationships with both contractors and in short delivery plan. But Sarah set out earlier we're we're starting to see the um, the fruits of that in terms of some new wards opening some really good care environments so that that that's one bit of good news um the final bit then i was just going to dwell on i i put a narrative in towards the end which was just around um the financial planning uh, as we look forward it says 22 23 actually which um clearly it's 23 24 um but there is a whole load of information that is just starting to come through uh sarah referred to it earlier um the, the system starts from a very difficult position um, in terms of our historic um, challenges around finance. We are operating as a system, so those start coming to the fore. 
Um, clearly, there's additional resource come in, but um, I think the likely expectation is that as a system, we're going to have to make some quite difficult decisions over the next um, six to eight week period as we as we draw plans together. Um, there's a lot of active work going on around that, but uh, as the the budgets come through to board via f &P, February and into March, it, it may well be that there are some tough prioritizations that we need to we need to address. So I suppose it was really uh, just to to make that clear. Um, obviously, cost control is going to be a large part of it as well as efficiency delivery and um, recruitment retention, bearing down on agency costs, all of those things are going to be writ uh, large across what we need to do. Um, and clearly folk are working hard on that at the moment. I'll, I'll stop there, Mark. Happy to take questions. Anybody got any questions on the finances at all? A couple of points I was going to make, Rob. Uh, one, if noted what you've you've been consistent. I was going to say over the last 12 months, you've been consistent in the last 18, 20 odd months that I've been with the trust in that difficult times are coming for the financial period 23, 24. If you need to bring us together for an extraordinary meeting of any sort because things are emerging and you you indicated difficult decisions will be needed if there needs to be a, a briefing of some sort in between our governance committees then say because it's of such importance i think this money versus safety and quality very often isn't it then please yeah. uh pl please say um but uh, jamie you had a point rob um i, I think i overlooked this uh, to this query at the committee but on page um, diligent 168 where you've got the savings profile for the year there's a lot still to be done in the current financial year it's been identified but a lot of a lot of big orange blocks how confident are we that they are going to convert to green before the end of March yeah the the, the majority of the orange blocks Jamie refer to the the non-recurrent stretch um, and effectively we're managing that through you know a variety of means in terms of uh, cost control slippage and so forth I, I'm I'm I am reasonably confident but that they're slightly different in terms of what we'd expect to see around a recurrent efficiency as opposed to how we're managing a non-recurrent uh, reduction in spend so um, yes uh, but that is the challenge over the last three months that we've managed to keep you know a balance between you know delivering the safe services and keeping keeping the money in in check Tessa thank you um Rob on the issue of agency um we know that there are framework agencies non-framework agencies and then those that are just off the chart as far as cost go um is any work being done at a system level to try and drive out the use of the most extreme priced agencies? I don't know whether I'm allowed to say their name in public, so I won't. Um, and indeed, is there anything being done nationally to drive out the use of those agencies that are just charging such phenomenal amounts of money for the service? Because while staff, while whilst people have the option to go to an agency that will pay them twice the amount of money they'll go there and quite naturally particularly in these hard times but if the if the work dries up for those agencies then they won't have that choice and they will go to more reasonably priced agencies to offer their services so is anything being done system-wide or nationally um there's a lot being done tessa and, and um clearly colleagues have very involved in this and you, you'll know through workforce but I suppose it, in terms of the specifics around that from a national perspective they're very clear around um, the, the price caps they put in place and the expectation that you know organisations will manage and arrange their affairs such that they as and when required to use agency um, that that they, you know, they're able to do that within so-called, um, you know, framework rates and agreement. Clearly, our, our, you know, our issue at the moment is that we are um, some way distant from that. I mean, I will remind uh, board that um, 1920, we actually had a very good record. So the new, the new kind of um, 
uh, guide that comes in is that we should be within 3.7% of our pay bill um, spent on agency. Now, historically, we were at about 3%, which was pretty good. At the moment, we are, you know, north of 9%, just to give you kind of scale of it. So it is complicated, isn't it? It's about the recruitment and retention piece because we need to bear down on the demand. Um, there's something for us and our system partners around how we're organising our services to manage capacity. And obviously, as we open short term or short notice surge capacity and so forth, we haven't got substantive staff, so uh, we need to go there. There's the whole support for our staff. Um, but there's also things that um, would be pointed to in terms of how we operationally manage things. So when we do know we need agency staff or temporary staff, are we actually thinking it through? Are we booking it in advance where possible? And, um, you know, the the really expensive agency and, you know, in, a, in our part of the world, that, that's Thornbury, um, tends to be because it is, you know, the, the agency of last resort, as it were, and it's short notice and it's um, due to the, the volume. All of those things we have internal uh, plans and task force we're putting in place, but, you know, that's going to be the challenge for us uh, around uh, how we do that. So it's, you know, we've, we've got to we've got to focus on both the demand side. So how much need we're generating as well as the supply side and actually who we are using for for that. And, you know, there's a tier, isn't there? There's a, off price cap frameworks right down to our own bank and so forth. So it's a big challenge, but it, it's one that is probably the most visible and certainly one of the ones that, um, you know, we, we have quite some way to go on. And sorry to prolong the pain, Rob, but agency, as you can appreciate, is a is a large part of our solution, in essence, if we're going to these difficult times ahead. Um, I think we've got all this information, but I don't think I've seen it all in one place. I've seen many pie charts on agency, but I would like a greater understanding of the areas where we're spending the agency in relation to the, the staff level. So whether that's mental health, it's inpatients, whether it's uh, community services, whatever it is, so we can get a greater understanding of exactly where it is. And the second part of it is where are we spending agency on the surge beds? or the surge areas, i.e. those bits of our service that weren't planned to be in place at the beginning of the year, but because of the, the pressures on the NHS. So because I think there are two, almost two separate things, the surge stuff, one can be forgiven for because they're just placed upon us. And in talking to colleagues, sometimes with almost no notice to find staff for additional beds. But some of the other areas, I think we can probably have a little bit more control over. And, and, and I'd like to get a better understanding of exactly where where it's spent in relation to our services. Is that at all possible to bring through to Tessa's uh, committee? Yeah, it's, it's very much possible. I could see Natalie uh, nodding. Uh, just, just two comments. So um, inpatient areas are by far the kind of the greatest driver of this, and that's both qualified and non-qualified and physical and mental health care. There's clearly a large area around medics, which John's focusing on. The other bit I'd say is when you look at the data, we just have to bear in mind that we might open capacity, but what we also do is we we don't just staff a new surge capacity or ward with agency staff because that wouldn't be clinically appropriate. We'll, we'll move staff around and we'll blend it, we'll end up backfilling. So there isn't always a direct, there it is, that's new capacity, therefore we can see direct the cost because some of it is around moving staff around to make sure it's safe. So, um, but absolutely, we, we've we've got that sort of information, and some of it's shared. We can we can cut it in different ways, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's nothing else, thank you, Robert, for the thoroughness of, of of those reports. If there are no other questions, we'll move on then to a couple of reports now, which have got Matthew's name against them, but I guess Sarah will be picking them up because I think Rob's on urgent calls as well. Uh, the operational update and the EPR core standards. Sarah, is it yourself? Yeah, thanks, Mark. If I kick off and then if other execs want to add, they can because Rob hasn't come back to us yet. So the operational report, uh, Matthew's just tried to outline some of our key areas of work. We've already talked about urgent care, but I would just draw your attention to the bit on the bottom of that report, which is on page 176, 
uh, about the frailty ward. So um, we haven't particularly touched on that today, but just to note there is still a national target around increasing access for patients to frailty ward services. There's a number of services under development. Um, Hereford had looked at a number of specialties, so Worcestershire. The main national focus is on frailty and for people with respiratory difficulties. We are leading the frailty virtual ward development and there's been quite a lot of work going into the model of how that might work. And we are out to recruitment for a couple of the key clinical posts. So just to bring that to your attention, and obviously that's in Wire Forest only as a pilot site first, hoping to start in January if we manage to recruit. So worth just drawing that out. Um, we've talked about the industrial action already, but you'll note on page 177 just some numbers which are helpful. So a, a total of 150 of our staff took part in the action um, taken by the RCN before Christmas. And we had to um, reschedule 900 appointments for patients. So that's important just to give the board a sort of sense of scale of, of the impact. And as you can imagine, um, rescheduling hundreds of appointments is not straightforward. So it's just to give you an awareness of the sort of scale of the challenge um, from the industrial action. But as we said earlier, all managed very well in the circumstances. You've got an update there on the Children and Young People's Transformation Programme and you know that we're focusing at the moment on community paediatrics because of the current demand and waiting lists. But just to note that there was a risk summit um, led by Natalie and John just before Christmas and, and a further one is going to happen in January. Uh, they may want to come in in a minute, but just to really get underneath the level of clinical risk and, and whether we were getting to the root cause of some of the issues. There is a significant issue in that service around administrative support. We've had a number of vacancies which are now filled and staff are starting in January. But as we know, there's a backlog post pandemic. So um, ongoing work and ongoing focus. And um, Natalie or John might want to comment in a minute. Um, neighbourhood mental health teams, you know, we've had a focus on for a long time and it's really pleasing to see that some of the teams are now getting to the point where they're fully staffed or only one post off being fully staffed, which is quite a significant improvement from the situation six months ago. So worth drawing out. And Matthew's also mentioned out of area placements, which includes a, a sort of ongoing and relentless focus on enabling people to move back to the local area as soon as possible. A lot of the out of area continues to be um, intensive care support needs. And you'll be aware from other conversations that the Mental Health Collaborative for the West Midlands is focusing on intensive care offer for the West Midlands as one of its key work programmes. So we're hoping that will also help us in the future to ensure that even if we need to access services for intensive care outside of Hereford and Worcester, that there hopefully will be a better West Midlands solution to keep people as close to home as possible. So I'll stop there, Mark, unless you want to ask Natalie or John to comment on that clinical risk summit. Uh, have Natalie or John got comments to make, I suppose, is the question. No, nope, doesn't look like it. So uh, no, uh, Martin has a question. Martin. Thank you, Sarah. It's, it's, it's really around the um, <clears throat> the virtual wards uh, and talking about a, a learning phase and testing out innovative technology and the extent to which we're doing it fresh or whether we're actually picking up all the um, testing and learning that's been done elsewhere and, and adopting it. I, I, I'm just a bit sceptical of some of the time we start new rather than just build and roll out what, what has worked everywhere else. Yeah, the um, the ICS digital program that looks at virtual technology is sort of overseeing and advising us on this one. And there is a system that's already been tested for other purposes in the county that they're looking at. So, so yes, they are trying to look and learn and see, but it's probably fair to say it's one of the areas of the virtual world development that I think is probably the final stage of the jigsaw because we've worked out the staffing model, we've worked out the clinical model, it's sort of ready to go. But actually that virtual technology and really getting that right is the remaining piece of work. And certainly, um, Will Taylor from the ICB and Heather MacDonald, who's in the ICB digital team, are supporting that. I don't know if Matthew wanted, uh, Natalie wanted to come in on that specific point. Are you coming back on that, Natalie? I was going to jump in back on the um, the risk oh, summit. I okay. was looking at John to if he wanted to respond, but <laughs> so if there's any more on that, otherwise I will just give a brief update about the risk summit. If that's okay. Yeah, just before you move on, just for non-executive colleagues' information, Hospital at Home Stroke Virtual Ward will be a, 
a discussion topic when we next meet. Sarah's going to bring along relevant colleagues to make sure we're up to date on on where we are with 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 that uh, initiative. So we'll learn we'll learn far more by the end of this month. That meeting is uh, yes, Natalie. Sorry, so just back to the um, the risk summit we held, and I just think it's worth noting that um, as Sarah's outlined, it the complexity of the challenge and the risk and the solutions meant that we're having a follow-up to still unpick all of that normally at, with, with the first RIC summit we get to the nub of the real key issues and we come away with a very clear action plan to address each of those root causes I think we got to a, a better understanding but due to the complexities we certainly didn't get to the end of that process in the first risk summit so a second is being held to complete that initial piece of work and I think at a relevant point, we then need to think about a system risk summit, which is what risk summits are supposed to be. They're supposed to be multi-agency risk meetings anyway, um, due to obviously that this isn't a, a solution that we can find by ourselves. This is an absolute system risk that needs to be understood and resolved together. Thanks, Natalie. Any questions or points on that operational update? And I know Rob's just uh, re rejoined us from, uh, from from sorting out the system. Um, so are there, are there any questions, Rob, back? But I think everybody's quite satisfied with what's written and what's been said. So thank you. Uh, we now move on to EPR core standards. And I assume with Rob back, Rob will be picking this up, Sarah. Is that correct? Just check with Rob if he wants me to do it or he's going to come in. Yeah, I'm happy to kick it off. Um, Thank you. But Sarah, if you could contribute or other colleagues can, can contribute if, uh, if if you feel necessary. So um, everybody's got the paper, obviously, at a high level. I think the the, the key things to to summarise is core standards uh, self-assessments being uh, completed. There has been a drop in our assurance as an organisation uh, from previously from substantial to non-compliance. Um, the reason being with the trust only being able to provide partial assurance to components of the assessment criteria. Within the report, there is a detailed appendix with regards to the self-assessment criteria and also, more importantly, the action plan and a comprehensive action plan associated with um, raising our performance for future sub, uh, submissions and uh, self-assessment. That will be scrutinised and, and monitored through the Quality and Safety Committee. I think a couple of key points that Matthew and Richard David Leach has asked, Davis Leach has asked me to, to, to highlight to board is that there are a number of factors behind why we've um, reduced our, our compliance level as, as or assurance level has been reduced. So um, there is a different standard of assessment required from NHSC now. Um, previous evidence that we've been able to submit and has been previously accepted in the past um, wasn't accepted or, or, or counted in this time round. Um, additionally, Richard's told me that some new standards have been introduced, which were only provided on release of the new standards, and there was limited time to be able to provide the required evidence um, to demonstrate that we meet those standards. And then additionally, um, I think uh, it's as has been mentioned several times through the meeting. These are quite unprecedented times coming out with the, coming out of the COVID pandemic and then into various business continuity incidents and now industrial in, uh, uh, industrial action. The challenges on our EPRR lead um, have 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 been very sort of apparent. Going forward, I think some of the things that Richard has asked me to highlight that are key to um, helping us uh, improve our, our levels of assurance for future self-assessment relate to training and exercising. So with regards to training and exercising, um, Richard's implemented three monthly communication tests and they'll continue to be carried out. And that includes things like text messages to mobile mobile phones, direct calling to test numbers, etc. Uh, operational tabletop exercises, they've been taking place specifically on fire evacuation, both at community hospital, community uh, and mental health inpatient units. 
Uh, engagement with multi-agency partners continues through the Local Resilience Forum um, and also attendance at joint training exercises. The last one was in November and that was in relation to a large scale unplanned power outage. On-call training for new staff going on to the on-call rate uh, rotors in place and that includes short scenario based uh, exercises as part of the training. Um, and command and control, um, although the paper is showing a downgrade in our resilient standards, um, the level of engagement in relation to EPRR has probably never been at a higher point, as I say, with industrial action, etc. And there's evidence of that today, actually, where I've been uh, uh, excused from board for the last hour or so, where I've been um, leading on uh, a number of silver and bronze me meetings in relation to the ambulance strike um, and also uh, operational pressures. So in the coming months ahead, uh, there's planning for a tabletop and live exercise, both at strategic and tactical levels. Um, further refreshing training for on-call managers. There is a plan for training for all reception staff in NHS buildings to open to the public on initial operational response to hazmat type incidents and also further fire and evacuation training for all inpatient areas, including a tabletop operational element to the exercise. I'll take a pause there. Um, there's a lot of information within the paper. I think key is the, the summary of our assessment and the actions associated with improving our, uh, our, our levels of compliance. As I say, these will be reported on a regular basis through Quality and Safety Committee and escalations to board as necessary. Thank you, Rob. A couple of points from colleagues. Uh, Jamie first and then Tessa. Thanks, Rob. I've got three questions if I just run through them. So the first one is about <clears throat> the rating and you mentioned and the report mentions how very short notice was provided for some of the changes, which I can understand, but quite a bit of the standard hasn't changed. And if uh, areas where we had substantial compliance before, we now no longer have substantial compliance. We don't have any compliance. So <clears throat> I'm I'm intrigued to understand why the part of the standards that haven't changed, why our, our compliance has dropped so much. And if it's to do with overall pressures, I, I, I suppose my gut feel is that the harder time to have complied with it would have been in the previous year when we had a rating of substantial because of the ongoing pressures at that time of the pandemic. So I'd just like a bit of an understanding about why. So the second point is I noticed that um, Worcestershire Acute and Y Valley are also at the, the same uh, non-compliant level, which is a concern for the system. But I, I, I wanted to know how widespread this was. You know, if, if it's a, if it's the case that um, everywhere has struggled because of the late notification of the changes, then that's one thing. But if if Worcestershire stands stands out alone as a, a, a non-compliant system, that'd be much more of a concern. And my third question is to do with the action plan, where I noticed that most of the actions are either six months or 12 months. And given that we are going to have a new rating in the summer, the actions that are timetabled for 12 months won't have been completed. And I wondered how much of a risk that was and whether we should accelerate those in order to ensure that the actions are completed before the 2023 re-rating. Thank you. I'll try my best to 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 answer those points that you've raised. If we if we kind of work backwards with regards to um, the time scales on the act actions, I think you're absolutely right. I will take that back both to Matthew and to Richard because, as you say, if we're looking at 12 months plus for some of the actions, then we're not going to achieve any improvement in relation to our future submission. And I think there is absolutely a sound challenge and point that we do need where possible to accelerate that. So I will absolutely take that back to to Matthew and Richard. With regards to and I think they're in connect, interconnected with regards to the existing standards and why we've dropped our compliance levels. And I think that's probably linked also to the acute trust and Y Valley in Hereford. 
Richard's described to me that previously we've been able to submit evidence for those standards, but the evidence acceptance for those standards has changed and that's implicated our compliance against those standards. So what we've previously submitted, we've not been it's not been accepted this time round. So um, I, my understanding is that's why um, we've been less compliant on those standards as previously because the evidence hasn't been submissible or acceptable. Thanks, Rob. And what about the point about how widespread beyond uh, our our system this this is? Uh, Rob, I, I may be able to assist here. If I take my chair's head off, Jamie, and put on my lead Ned EPR role, I've had long discussions with Richard about this. Um, the evidence side of it, there's been no change in the standard, no change in the evidence, and there's been no change in the formal assessment of the evidence by framework either. It's merely a change in subjective judgment for that person that applied their subjective judgment to the evidence. It's a new person that's come into the system in the West Midlands. It's as simple as that. They have in these type of plans, it's dead easy to start asking the what ifs and the what ifs and you know, prove the evidence that proves the evidence that proves the evidence, etc. So there's been a far more, shall we just call it a rigorous assessment of the evidence. It's Richard's viewpoint that we've actually submitted additional stronger evidence this year. And yet we are in some areas, yet we've received this downgrading. So it's basically a subjective judgment issue. And yes, it has affected wider. That's why Y Valley and Worcestershire. And actually, it would appear, although the evidence is emerging across West Midlands, the individual that has had this as a role in the West Midlands uh, region, NHS, is applying their, their sub subjective judgment. And as I've said to Richard, I make no judgment about whether the old judgment was right or the new judgment was right, but it is certainly a different subjective judgment. And everybody that is submitting evidence to this individual is coming up against exactly the same thing. Um, example of, I can't remember the exact figures, but 40 odd of the, um, there was, we had 40 uh, standards that were at the substantial were, 20 odd of them were downgraded to uh, non-compliant without any change in the standard or any change in the evidence submitted. So that that's one of the main reasons why it's actually happening. And it's all a little bit brand new and Richard and colleagues are starting to get under the skin about it. I did ask Richard quite strongly and I interrogate, I'm sure Rob would tell you he was interrogated <laughs> quite strongly by me. Richard's subjective view is that we're now stronger than we've ever been because of our experience of pandemic, our experience of industrial action, our experience of care notes, to name just three. So we're actually, he feels subjectively that we're stronger, but the EPRR core standards are not suggesting that, uh, if that helps at all, Jamie. It's not a good position to be in, but that, that's, that's the position that we found ourselves in, it would appear. Tessa. Thanks. Jamie's asked one of my questions, but one I wanted to make a comment and um, then a very pedantic point. Um, my comment is I'm really pleased to hear about the training for on call because I think it's really important that we have a um, consistent approach to the challenges that on call bring and that people understand what they can and can't do. Um, I think some of the most terrifying times of my career ever was when I was on call in an acute hospital um, and actually having that consistent approach and being able to operate the same out of hours, evenings and weekends is really important for us as an organisation. My other very pedantic point is it would be really helpful if on the front sheet of this paper it said EPRR core standards and not just core standards. Because when I was hunting, when I was flicking back through diligent, I couldn't find where I was looking for it. It was because EPRR wasn't there. So it might be good just to make sure it's there. Thank you. Or even the full title rather than EPRR. OK, I, I, I suspect that's all been noted by Rob. Yeah. Yeah, all those points, that. all those points noted, Tessa. And can I just add with the on call, I think it's a really valid point. On call is something that nobody um, enjoys doing. Um, 
alongside EPRR, we now have in place operationally a quarterly on-call meeting where we bring together all the on-call leads and managers to share experiences, promote good practice out of hours, et cetera. And we link in with Richard to kind of um, promote a consistent message around EPRR. Thanks, Rob. Um, just to finally wrap up again, I haven't got my chair's head on when I mentioned this. Uh, with all that's going on and all that's to come at us, I think uh, the team need to consider whether we have the appropriate resource for EPRI, Emergency Plan of Risk and Resilience, in place. Uh, and I make no judgments at all, but I think with everything that's going on, we need to be sure that that is the case. I know that when we lost Sharon, uh, to her new role, and congratulations to her down in Gloucestershire, she had a background in this. And so, although it perhaps wasn't explicit, Sharon took away, you know, perhaps 25% of the expertise that we, we had in this area. It's just a question for Sarah and the team to carry forward, nothing more than that. Um, and the other thing that I would, I would comment on is our weakness around this area is testing and exercising. Notably, not the slow burn stuff, no pun intended, but all those three events, um, sorry, they tend to be of a not so immediate nature. The strike is a good example. We know it's coming. We can plan. We can do things. We can get things in place, make sure the right people are, are available on the day, etc. Our weakness is probably more around the something that happens at two o'clock on a Sunday morning, you know, and it's a, a full evacuation required, white powder, fire, whatever it might be, electrical outage, whatever it might be. And they're the things that probably would test the on call uh, to their to their their maximum, and they're the areas we need to keep going on. And in my discussions with Richard, he rightly points out we're so operationally busy it would be difficult to run exercises and and uh, tabletops when we're so operationally busy. A little pushback from me would be there's no better time to do it than when you're absolutely maxed out busy because if you can do it then you've got everything covered. But um, it's not an easy area where we are in, a, in an operational arena that we're in at the moment. But uh, unless there's any further questions, thank you, Rob, and to the team behind this report. Uh, it's, it's an insurance policy, this is really. We hope none of this ever happens. But when it does happen, we do rely and fall back on it quite strongly. So if we can note that for assurance, then what level of assurance did we apply to that? Sorry, my screen's gone blank on my reports. Can somebody assist me, please? If I'm looking at the right report, which which probably seems about right where we uh, where we are in terms of the the new standards and the new assessment. Okay, thank you. Uh, if we could then move on to the green plan, which I assume would be Rob Robert. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, so this provides the uh, the update on year one of our green plan, which you recall we took through board um, a year ago. Um, Julie is the NED sponsor, but it's it's overseen through FNP. So we we had the opportunity for a, a full run through this at December committee meeting. Um, just a few key elements to draw out then really. Um, the system positioning around um, green and net zero uh, is still just drawing together actually the meeting just a few days ago around how we draw together the, the system part. I think it's likely that over the next uh, the coming months, maybe six, 12 months, there'll be a move to, towards more of a, a place um, view on some of these elements. But at the moment, each provider has a fairly clear plan around where they need to go. Our current green plan, um, in line with what we were asked to do nationally, is sets out a three year um, um, scheme of works and ambition. And this report picks up the in the appendix the um the actual national deliverables clearly our plan is broader than that but there's there's a blend here between some of the national must do's as well as the things that we're trying to do um first year there's obviously a lot of just making sure we've got the infrastructure the governance and some of the supporting surveys and things underway but you'll also see we've managed to do a lot of the things that we're asked to do um by, by the national team probably you know some of the things that um, will have the biggest difference, but you know we're probably more 
uh, back office to do was actually switching the electricity to uh, to green supply and things like that. So um, overall, F and P had good run through this, and we we set that at an assurance level of five. So good progress, but clearly there's an awful lot to go at here. Um, and um, what we'll be expecting back at F and P in the uh, it's the eight. Uh, yeah, April is the is the plan for the for the coming year, which will which will pick out both any national parts and some of the more local things we're hoping to do that will make a bit of a difference within our with our trust. Um, happy to uh, answer any queries. Anybody have any questions on this? It did have a good airing at uh, at, at subcommittee. No, the, the only comment I was going to make, Robert, is much of this work falls upon that very team that we have highlighted in the risk 1154 with regard to estates and facilities. So we do need to be minded success around this and other areas falls into that risk around our estates and facilities team. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we can we note this report update? Thank you. Jill, have I, have I missed something on EPR? I think Matthew was asking if oversight of the EPR core, EPR's core standards could be delegated to quality and safety, which I which I missed. But I clearly had a note from your team to make sure I did it and I failed. So uh, are we comfortable to delegate this, the EPR core standard oversight to um, quality and safety? I will put one caveat is that we've sort of stepped backwards according to the paperwork according to the paperwork so i would like board to receive updates from janet's uh, committee with regard to how we're doing it against that action plan uh, if it's any way off kilter at all because i think we do need to keep on top of that if that's okay uh, jill yeah i mean it's slightly odd that this is obviously um within the remit of q s and has come separately to board and just for clarity purposes it's come separately to board because there is um a request through these um the guidance that board has explicit oversight of this um there's also obviously mark you'll be familiar with the guidance that the ned lead is involved and um it is also in, has discussions about it so i would anticipate this coming back as a minimum annually to board as part of that guidance with the closer overview from q s and obviously q s then has the ability to escalate if there are particular concerns but just in case people thought it was a bit odd that we're doing it twice it's as there is it's one of those quirky areas that there's a specific requirement OK, we're comfortable with that being uh, delegated as appropriate there to q &S. OK, thank you. Uh, which takes us to ICT strategy, Dave. David, this is also an airing, didn't it, which we party to? It, thank you. It, it did, yeah. I'll just take you through um, like Robert did there with the highlights. Um, obviously, a five year programme. Uh, digital strategy was signed off in uh, January 21 by the board. Um, five key themes, digital infrastructure, uh, enabling the use, effective the use of technology, digital connect patients and so on. Um, when we took this to FMP, we reduced the assurance level from six to a five, mainly around the fact that we, we'd got no evidence of the benefits that some of these schemes uh, were, uh, were making for pa patients and staff. So um, we also identified in the report that EPMA and bed management go live was an issue uh, which had a lower level of assurance simply because obviously without care notes we were we were going to struggle to implement new systems and indeed the staff's capability of taking new change on top of everything else was a consideration so in terms of progress to date we've replaced a large number of pieces of equipment and the wi-fi and we have improved the network um, hopefully with a benefit it's much more quicker and robust infrastructure for um, office workers and remote workers um, we've moved systems from data centers to try and improve resilience and and capability in terms of uh, capacity and speed uh, in terms of effective use of technology we've obviously 
been working closely with uh, the shared care record. Obviously, the care notes outage has, has not helped that, but that's been moving forward. And we've also got to a point with EPMA and bed management patient flow, which would mean that we are in a good position to implement those once uh, care notes settles back down. The other key thing around effective use of technology and digitally connecting patients is in the planning guidance, um, key to um, moving forward is that access to um, information uh, for patients. Uh, and we've been working now and launched the uh, My, Wealth, My Health and Wellbeing Patient Portal. Um, and that will give patients access to appointments and letters within a few months um, with a, more features planned. Um, different ways of working. We're looking at robotic process automation to try and speed up some repetitive tasks. Um, and what we're trying to do is also link into the people strategy to ensure that digital plays are a part of um, staff's engagement with the organisation. Um, we've undertaken a number of process mapping exercises to, to look at where digital can help improve efficiencies. Um, and we've worked um, quite hard on service desk accreditation and certification. We're doing regular surveys to gain user feedback and we're developing um, a training package that hopefully will get uh, much better um, staff engagement in the process of uh, uh, continuous learning on our, our EPRs. Key feature of this year has obviously been in the second part of this year has really been around the care notes outage um, and the, the process of recovery and restoration, which we've got a, a dedicated hub uh, set up now um, that's working through uh, getting information back on care notes. Care notes has been tested. As, as Sarah mentioned, we, we've done the work around um, assurance in terms of cyber security um, and we're looking at getting information and systems back on as soon as possible. I think the first pilots are going live this week or are going live this week. As part of that recovery and restoration we, we created um, new material, uh, we created the XDS repository which was part of the plan uh, but we've used that to give patients access, sorry, give staff access to records whilst the EPR has been down. Um, again, we're, we're testing care notes. We've tested care notes, we've fed back, and we're now in a position where we can start adding, adding users to it. In terms of next steps, what we want to do is to continue those customer, in, uh, customer service improvements, uh, get more feedback on our um, service that we're providing. We've done a service desk accreditation process, so we're starting on that process to make sure our staff are responding to our um, um, customers uh, in a timely and efficient manner. Um, and then in, in terms of next steps, we're obviously going to continue equipment replacement. Uh, we're implementing uh, EPA, EPMA and bed management We've done a lot of work around clinical data repository, but there's more to do. Um, what we're also doing now is to look to refresh the strategy to be more focused around electronic patient records. As you know, uh, what we're trying to do is to look at procuring a replacement potentially for some of our big uh, corporate EPRs, which are um, coming to the end of their contract life. Um, that really sort of summarises things, apart from obviously the, the other thing that we need to do is to look at how the planning guidance impacts um, our delivery. I think when we've looked at it initially, uh, we've got things like virtual wards already underway. Um, we've looked at population health management in, in the um, sort of summary level, but we need to do much more with um, uh, population health management. So really just a whistle stop tour through that. OK, um, thank you, David. I've got three people that wish to comment stroke question. Uh, Jamie, Janet and Martin. So Jamie first, please. Thanks, David. Um, 
This is a very positive report and it was very well received at, uh, at FMP. Um, uh, David has mentioned how the assurance rating was lowered because we needed more information on impact. Uh, what we were what we were talking about at FMP was how we uh, how we triangulate the, the the positive information that's reported to us with the often different feedback we get from staff about IT. Um, and uh, we agree that we needed a more systematic way of gauging staff feedback and an understanding what's behind any residual staff concerns about the effectiveness of IT and whether it's uh, helping or hindering patient care. And my, my point in raising that is, it is not to repeat the conversation we had at FMP, but it's more um, on the governance side, a lot of these reports that come to board have been to committees first. And I just feel there ought to be a way of, of trying to capture some of the comments that were made at committee en route to the board um, so that when it when it comes here today that uh, board is aware of, of the, the content of the, the main point of the discussion um, that was given by committee. So it's not it's not to re it's not to restart the debate about about staff feedback. It's to really ask whether in future there could be a way, perhaps in the format of the pro forma of the report, to pick out the um, the main points that the kind of parent committee, as it were, made en route to board. Absolutely, Jamie. We'll, we'll definitely look at uh, how we might uh, affect that. Yes. I think that's a more sort of general point, which uh, probably Jill, Sarah, and myself consider at some stage, just because this is one report. But there are multiple areas where that could apply to Jamie. I think it's a, it's a reasonable point, and we need to look at that. Thank you, um, Janet. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking that actually the minutes of the, we we do have the minutes of the meetings coming to board, but it's just looking at how you know how detailed those are. So I suppose that needs to just be thrown into the pot. Um, my my comment was going to be about the help desk, um, just to say that I can remember when we had the discussion about taking that in house, um, and just feed, just making the comment that actually it's really the feedback there is really positive, and I think it's quite uncommon to get such positive feedback about an IT help desk. So it was just to comment on that. Um, I note that you know this comment made that we've only had um, response rate of one percent, but actually I think that people if people have negative feedback they're going to respond. Um, so it was really just to to emphasise the positive nature of that. One question, it was just about actually just thinking about, as Jamie said, about, you know, when you talk to people and you go out and talk to people, very often they do have a few niggles, not, not about the help desk, but about IT in general. And very often it's the, about the equipment um, or maybe their training. Um, and I just wondered if there's any difference between Herefordshire and Worcestershire. Have we have we addressed that? Because I remember going out and visiting in Herefordshire and people there were definitely, you know, more negative. That was my, you know, my impression than in Worcestershire. So I just wondered whether where we are with that, really. Yeah, we've put a lot of resource into addressing some of the issues in Hereford. You're right about um, the 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 issues that we're facing. Uh, Robert and I and Jamie went out. Uh, the, there was an issue with um, devices in community settings, uh, tablets. So what we're trying to do there is to set up our, our own internal problem management group effectively to try and deal with or understand in some detail what, what the issues are there. So um, in general, it, it does seem to be the mobile tablet type solutions with EMIS um, that are causing most of the, the issues that we, we see. Um, but that's been a constant problem, which we've done a numerous different solutions for. And, and I'm afraid sometimes with with signal quality and, and various other issues, it, it is a it does impact the view on IT and we need to continue to do it. But uh, it's been a really intransigent problem. Thanks, David. If we go to Martin and then finally be Tessa. David, David, thanks. I think there's a very positive report and I absolutely agree with what's been said. And therefore, I'm slightly nervous about asking this, but but um, I think the, the, the rating of six in the report and, or five is 
is great in the context of the strategy that we set out two years ago and the changes that have happened versus the pandemic. I just wonder what the thought is around where could it be, where could our ambition be um, based on using technology to really change the way in which we deliver our services to do the to do the population health and uh, I'm, I'm slightly nervous of uh, a five-year strategy in digital but uh, core ICT absolutely but the digital pace of engagement change and, and working with um, people across populations is moving at such a pace I just wonder how we're keeping pace with that and really in the context of some of the stuff we had at the IC, um, the ICS for finance forum, which seemed to be lagging us in a quiet way, and I just wonder the extent to which we're we're delaying innovation or or moving more slowly because of the need to move forward as an ICB in some of this stuff. Yeah, I, it's a good point, Martin. I I, I have to say that we we're we've we've not been as innovative as we could be with some of the strategy thus far because it's building the foundations of, of the services um once we come to um the epr replacement and other schemes such as that then i think we we need to look at how we can improve the whole sort of patient journey and, and the clinical pathway um i think that the the key is to keep that uh, strategy refreshed um, dependent on on the prevailing, you know, planning guidance, ICS direction of travel. Um, we are sort of keen to promote things like the shared care record and the patient portal. Um, what we'd like to see is much more by way of the utilisation of, of patient portal. So that's where we want to try and, you know, concentrate some of our activity. But again, we, we tend to get... Um, uh, we have to work at the pace of the ICS, which is which is as you would expect it to be. Thank you. And finally, Tessa. Um, thanks, Mark. Just a, a positive feedback, really. Sarah and I did um, patient safety visits on Friday morning, and I think for me, I think Sarah had encountered it previously, but for me, the first time ever I did a patient safety visit where they weren't complaining about IT and actually were really looking forward to getting care notes back. And that was um, really good to hear. So um, I think that reflects on the fact that IT is being, issues are being resolved quickly and they realise what they're missing when they haven't got care notes, despite the fact that so many teams didn't want care notes when it came out. So a really positive um, picture, really. Thank you, Tessie. Thank you, Tess. It's always it's always good to end on a positive. And uh, David, in the context of care notes and delivering this strategy, it's a great report, as I think Jamie said. And also, we're uh, we're pushing ahead in a load of areas outside of the the difficulties you've had around care notes. Congratulations to you and the team, and please pass that on. If we can note that report, and then move to uh, managing conflicts of interest in the NHS, Jill. Yeah, this is another of those reports that we're required to bring to board annually. Um, in effect, we have processes in place for seeking declarations. Board members will be fully familiar with every March. We ask for updated declarations as well as uh, doing our um, fit and proper person declarations at that point. We also seek declarations from those staff uh, employed on the highest echelons of Agenda for Change. And um, for the past couple of years now, we've sought declarations from um, consultants um, and dentists. Uh, and that process is ongoing. And um, we do an annual report about the effectiveness of the process and any glitches to the audit committee. So this report is just presented for information. The uh, declarations there are for trust board that are included. Um, and obviously, if anybody's got any amendments to let me know, but we will be doing refreshed declarations, as I said, in March for all trust board members as part of the annual process. Anybody no, have any questions or, or declarations? No, I think it's a standard report and... and uh, Martin, I don't know if you comment from an audit perspective, how, how 
how do our consultants respond? Do they all give a positive as in here's my declarations or here's a, a non, non-applicable response? Can you remember from audit committee reports? Yeah, I think Joe, Joe will correct me, but I think I think the situation is significantly improving over the last over the last 18 months, year, two years, and we've got a much higher level of response than than perhaps we previously had. So it is a, a, a vastly improved position on, on where we were. OK, thank you. Do, I was going to say, I could say, Mark, that we, we do now get declarations from everybody, including a nil return. It's probably as a result of linking it to the appraisal process where there is a requirement uh, for consultants, which has probably made this job much easier because they can't sign off appraisals um, without the requirement. So, and yeah. that obviously impacts in other ways. So, whilst it is um, an onerous, onerous, um, has to uh, do and keep up to date. We are in a much better position there than uh, we have been historically. Okay, thank you very much. So we can note that report. Thank you, Jill. Uh, we've got a couple of memorandums of understanding now, which I think Sue's going to take us through. Uh, the first one is between ourselves and our closest partners uh, over at the Acute Trust. Sue. Yeah, thank you. And pleased to see that Joe's just joined us for this item. Um, likewise, tomorrow I'm going to be attending the Acute Trust Board to do the same To um, And so clearly this builds on the joint board session we had last year. We did say then we wanted to formally commit to more joined up working. We obviously gave some strong examples of where we're already doing so. So um, this really is a paper that captures the content of that discussion and puts it in the frame of some of the work we've already done across Worcestershire around place development. So some of the language is mirrored in the Worcestershire Executive Committee, which we felt was important because this is us as two NHS providers working very closely together around the Worcestershire place agenda. So it sort of sits within that context. And um, what I was going to do was just quickly take some headlines from the paper, then ask Joe for some comments. You've been doing some work, haven't you, Joe, with uh, your, your senior team and your board? So some comments really around um, how we see this progressing. And it is for approval with also the recommendation that we set up a smaller steering group to progress the priorities and the next steps and the level of formality that we might want to move into over the upcoming uh, the 12 months. So we put into the paper the context around provider collaboratives. We know there's an increasing focus on working and consolidating where we can to bring some um, additional resilience and mutual aid and to deliver some things at scale and pace. We picked up much of this, as I said, last year, but it was a start for 10. So the addendum does pull through more details around the priority areas, successes to date, where we want to go further, faster over the next 12 months. Um, we've also talked about the cross-organisational development. Um, I know that there's been the NEDs coming together. There's been some joint visiting and clearly we want to build on that. Um, and then the memorandum of understanding then just puts some more formal context around how we want to work together, specifically some of our, our behaviours and our, our joined up opportunities and playing that through in the place uh, landscape. So, Joe, did you want to just quickly come in and, and put some comments in from the acute trust perspective before we go through to comments and hopefully onward approval from board? And before you do, Joe, welcome. And uh, for those who don't know Joe Newton, she's Sue's opposite number, should we call it, in, in Worcestershire, Worcestershire Acute Trust. So welcome, Joe, and thank, thank you for coming along. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon. So as Sue said, this has been a little bit of a slow burn, um, but it's something that we've really wanted to um, bring to the board's attention as a first step um, to future collaboration together. And I think we very much view the MOU as the framework in which we can have those future conversations. So we've, we've talked about this um, from a Worcester Acute perspective, um, both through the executive, but also um, through our TME, which is our equivalent of the Division Operations Group, and then with our Finance Performance Subcommittee, and it will go to board tomorrow. I think the main feedback was just that in terms of actually an MOU is just an MOU. Um, it's what we do with it and how we use it and how we build that collaboration together that's going to make the difference. Um, so I hope that sort of chimes with people on the gallery as well. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Joe. Anybody got any questions about this at all? Uh, as 
Joe indicated, it's been a bit of a slow burn, but, and it was described to me as it, it's motherhood and apple pie, which it could be. But on the other hand, I'm, my NHS memory is very limited compared to many on this screen. But if I go back six years and think of the two trusts signing this willingly and with smiles on their faces, my take is that just wouldn't have happened. Not a chance in the world. And we can forget how we have moved together in the system to where we are now. And some of the words in there are quite strong. And it's not about this trust and the acute trust. It's about the patients and citizens of, of Worcestershire in, in this case, and when we do elsewhere Herefordshire. That's what this is about. And I, I was really pleased to see it. And uh, I'll be quite pleased and proud if I'm asked to sign it. I, I can't remember the bottom of whether it's Sarah, myself or both of us. I suspect both, because that's how these things normally go. Um, but if nobody's got any questions, are we happy to note the contents of Sue's report, which asks us to note a number of things, uh, endorse the uh, MOU, get it appropriately signed, assuming that it goes through uh, Joe's board tomorrow. And I assume, Sue, you're attending board tomorrow, reciprocal? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are we all comfortable with that? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. We'll take that as approved, Sue. And uh, assuming it goes through the acute trust tomorrow, uh, we we'll look forward to signing that. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Thank you. Bye. Move on to the second one now, which is the West Midlands uh, Collaborative, Mental Health Collaborative. Uh, Sue again. Yes, I mean, we've covered the content of um, the provider collaborative across the West Midlands in some detail, actually, both at board and within the mental health collaboration. So uh, you've got a bit of a, an update here around some of the activities of the provider co um, collaborative and some of the developments. We are really uh, focusing down now on a key number of priorities. Sarah talked earlier around the psychiatric intensive care bed capacity being one example of that. But there are a number where it relates to training, supervision at scale, the, the staff wellbeing hub future. So they really have got some teeth in this space now. So it did feel timely to basically formalise that further again. This is an MOU that's going round all of our partner trust boards throughout January. Um, Jill has uh, commented on both MOUs. I should have said that about the previous items being involved in the formulation of this too. Uh, I didn't know, given that Sarah's also been around the table around the West Midlands right from inception when we did our early work with Mike Farrow, whether you wanted to put some comments, Sarah, before I open up to questions. Um, I guess I guess I'd just add obviously this is slightly more complex in terms of getting agreement of the MOU in particular because of the number of trusts involved so we're talking of all of the trusts in the West Midlands now but there's a huge momentum and commitment around the provider collaborative in the West Midlands now and it just seemed like the right time to sort of quantify some of that I guess and put it more formally into writing of what we're trying to achieve but a bit like the Worcester Acute one I guess both of these in my opinion are, are fairly live documents um, they're both new formal MOUs, so we will need to keep them under quite regular review. But I think it's really positive that we've got to this point. I'm happy to comment on any of the detail if that helps. Does anybody have any questions? Steve? At the risk of really embarrassing myself here, um, uh, latest health and social care legislation, I thought there was a legal obligation placed upon organizations to collaborate and so I'm, I'm just wondering why MOU um, the, in the bits I've read suggest this is uh, there's no legal uh, obligation and I, I, I might be wrong in all of those respects so uh, happy to be told so. And I think, I mean, Sue might want to comment. My my understanding is there's a requirement for each provider to be part of a provider collaborative, but I don't think there's anything specific about what that would include. Is that your understanding, Sue? Well, I was going to say something similar. I think the legal obligation, um, we could have said there was always a, a moral imperative to do so for the our population. What we wanted from these documents was to be clearer who with and what you know what what we're actually going to do and, and what does that look like over a time frame as Sarah said um these these have to be regularly reviewed if they're going to have any teeth they've actually got to then move into an operating environment where we are genuinely doing things differently together and improving outcomes so for me it's it's more about how 
who we're working with, how we're working with them and actually what that's going to deliver. And that's what the documents are really starting to sort of pull some detail around. My understanding, Steve, is, is it's nothing more than a duty to collaborate from the Act. And of course, that, that can be interpreted in multiple different ways. And oh. these these MOUs are, are, are our and our, our colleague trusts um, attempt to demonstrate that duty or part of that duty, not all of it. Uh, and that, that's where it comes from. Are we happy to, to sign up to this MOU? I think there's nods all around, so we, we can take that as approval. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, there are no documents for uh, sealing. Uh, unfortunately, there are no consultants to, to know the appointment of, uh, which takes us to the board assurance framework. Is there anything that's come out today that we think isn't captured or captured strongly enough or explicitly enough in the in the BAF? I have one. Go on in, Sarah. I guess it's just the urgent care comment, Jill mentioned before which we probably need to note here because we know this is a significant risk to us and it's whether it's strong enough in the BAF so that's under ongoing review but that would be the only one I'd flag. Okay, thank you and I would apply the same to agency spend. I think agency it, it's in there and financial um, sustainability is in there but it looks like it's ratcheting up more and more and as Rob indicated in the last three years we've gone from three percent to nine percent broadly and our budgets can be predicated on us getting a grip of this, I'm guessing. And so I, I, I'd i like to think that the BAF reflects that in its strongest manner to make sure we're quite robust around agency. So so can we can we ensure that that is reflected in the BAF, please? I can't remember the absolute detail in the BAF, but it's that's the other thing that came out to me of today's meeting. Yeah, there's some nods around Jill. I think certainly um, look to have a discussion about that. Of course, we've got to remember that the BAF is about what is stopping us potentially from achieving our strategic objectives and um, probably want to just work through what the implications are. It's obviously a very significant area for us and is something of continuing oversight and likely to become of greater focus, I think, as part of the uh, oversight regime. Um, but just in that context, we just need to bear in mind as to whether actually the agency expenditure is something that's stopping us achieving our strategic objectives or is at risk of doing that. So I'd just put that proviso, but um, perhaps if the executive team can have a discussion about that and then uh, we can uh, probably feedback a discussion at the next uh, round of committees as appropriate. If I could put a, just a bit of flavour on my comment then. If we if we if we carry on the trajectory of agency spend, it will mean we can't spend elsewhere. That will certainly stop us achieving our objectives around the quality of care, safety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That that's where I was coming from. It's about the trajectory. Um, of the spend. But yeah, if if exec colleagues could, could have a look at it. Thank you. Uh, if there's nothing else, thank you. Uh, I've been not uh, indicated any other business come to light. Has nothing come to light whilst we've been on this meeting? Sorry, I was just looking at um, Sarah. Did you put a comment somewhere? Oh, yeah, it was just about the BAF. It was oh, just okay. to say that obviously we've already got workforce and financial achievements both on the BAF. So it's probably agencies covered within some of the detail of those. So it's probably just reviewing that to see if it's sufficiently okay. picked up. Yeah. Thank you. So there's no no other business that I'm aware of. Uh, next meeting is on April the 8th for a public meeting. Thank you to, to colleagues. Sorry, Mark, the, it's, the next meeting is March for a public meeting. That's a what did I say? April. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just looking for the sun to come back. I've got it clearly written down as eighth of March, Wednesday, eighth of March. So clearly I'm just just hoping for the sun to come back. But let's 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 not wish our lives away. So next meeting is the eighth of March. Um, thank you to the guests that have come along to support us. Thank you to board colleagues. Um, I would suggest board colleagues we meet again for part two at one o'clock. One o'clock, and we'll have a, a three quarters hour lunch. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.